The format of each is similar in that we set the scene by explaining the process and of the plan in general, and then we delve into a series of teams in more detail. Tonight's team, as John has, as John has outlined, is climate and transport. Katrina and Nicholas will give more detail on these. My goal here is to explain the importance and scope of the draft development plan. And finally, the other purpose is for all you to engage further with the process. And if you have any comments on topics raised here tonight, we do encourage you to make a submission to the process. So the process itself and where we're at. So there are three stages to, making of, to the making of any development plan, each of which has a public consultation stage. So the first stage, the pre-draft stage, that's completed. We've now moved on to stage two, which is the draft stage. And finally, then we'll move to stage three, which is amendments to the draft plan. The area here highlighted in red is in the slide here is where we are right now. Public consultation stage of the draft plan. We are seeking submissions until the 12th of March, which will bring this stage to a close. It is important to know that the issues raised in every submission must be summarised. The chief executive will give her opinion on the issues raised. All of that information is put into the chief executive report, which is brought to the council chamber for consideration by the county councillors. It is likely because of those submissions, a number of changes will be proposed to the draft plan. Those changes know, are known as material amendments. Then we move to stage three, which is a public consultation on any amendments put forward. Again, we will seek submissions, each of which will be summarised. The chief executive gives her opinion on each of these submissions again. We compile these into a report and it goes back to the chamber for final adoption by the members. So then the development plan and what is it? So it's the big overall spatial plan for the city and county. It's made every six years and will cover the period from 2021 to 2027 and it sets a framework for the future and physical development of the county. So um, the Office of the Plan Regulator refers to the development plan as a plan that will shape our community in numerous ways. It is important to recognise that the content of the development plan is one of the best ways both individuals and communities can engage with and influence the planning process that will shape our surroundings. So the plan structure, what is contained in our draft plan, our draft Kenny plan? The plan is publicised as two volumes. So volume one covers the, covers entire, the entire county. county. And volume two contains specific city, city policies and objectives. There are 13 appendices overall as part of this plan. And it's also accompanied by two environmental reports. So the strategic environmental assessment and the natural impact report. For instance, the appendices include the wind energy strategy, which Katrina will discuss later in the presentation, and it also includes the retail strategy, which we discussed last week, and housing strategy. So the development plan must also take account of our wider national and regional planning and infrastructure investment policies. This slide illustrates the hierarchy of plans in the Irish context and how the plan is influenced by numerous other plans and legislation. So on the left hand side here is the EU national legislation and policy, such as planning and development acts and the guidelines as published by ministers. In the middle then is the pl plan hierarchy here in Ireland. So we have the national planning framework at the top and then reg uh, regional tier, this, which is your RSES, regional spatial economic strategy, and then move down to the local, which is the development plan. On the right then is various other plans and strategies such as your local economic community plan which feed into the making of the development plan. So just to give you a flavour of what is in the plan, these are just some of the themes. Climate change is now front and centre and forms chapter two of the plan. Other themes include how to make rural communities stronger and there is an objective around a programme for new housing in small towns and villages in conjunction with infrastructure agencies such as Irish Water. Climate change, action and transport form the main theme for tonight's meeting and I'll let Katrina and Nicholas speak about this in more detail. Climate change is set out in chapter two and also there's as chapter 11, renewable energy volume one. Transport is set out in chapter 12, volume one and the movement and mobility strategy is in the, for the city is also found in volume two. And then heritage, this is another large component of the plan and that has a chapter in both volume one and volume two. And heritage is part of the team for next week's webinar on Monday next, the 8th of February, and there's still time to register for this event. So I've touched on the main themes, but just to give you an overview of the plan structure, the two volumes are made up of chapters and maps. Within each chapter, 
there are policies, objectives and development management standards. Policies are a statement of the council's intent and they make up the bulk of the plan text. Objectives are picked out and these are specific attainable deliverables that the council are now committed to if they make their way to the adopted plan. For example, in the context of renewable energy, we have objective 11C for Kenny County to meet 100% of electricity needs by the, for the county by 2030. Development management standards then are the standards that every application must adhere to. So public consultation. So to reiterate the schedule of our webinars here. So this is the third in a series of these webinars and we've one more scheduled for Monday next, uh, which is based heritage, built and natural, and it'll also cover placemaking. So finally, how do you make a submission? So we encourage everyone to make a submission to the process. If you have any comments arising from tonight's discussion, there is three ways to make a submission. Firstly, it's consultation portal. So our consult.kilkenny.ie and we encourage everyone to create an account, which is an extremely easy process. And it results an advantage to this by registering for an account with that portal. You can keep up to date with any future consultation events you may be interested in, such as the next stage of this process. The second option is you can email to our plan at kilkennycoco.ie or you can post in to the address shown here on the screen. And this address is also available on our website, as is the email address. Um, it is also important to note that the 12th of March is the deadline, so there is still plenty of time to consider the issues that will be raised here tonight. And we look forward to receiving these over the coming weeks. Thank you for your time and I'll hand you back to John. Thanks very much, Naomi. Uh, that's Naomi Scully, who's a planner with Kilkenny County Council. And we have two other uh, presentations. Nicholas Flow will talk about movement and mobility. Uh, those two subjects. Uh, Dennis Malone, who's the senior planner, will speak uh, after the presentations. But next, uh, I'm going to ask Katrina O'Sullivan, who's an executive planner with Kilkenny County Council, who's going to talk to you about renewable energy. Over to you, Katrina. Thank you. Um, OK, um, thanks, everyone. Thanks, John. So my name is Katrina O'Sullivan. I work in the forward planning section of the council. And my aim here tonight is to show how climate action has been incorporated into the draft plan and to explore some of the key elements of the plan in that regard. So I'll start off by exploring the policy context for climate action. This includes outlining the targets and objectives um, for climate actions that have been incorporated into the plan. One of the main ways that the plan can contribute to climate action is, of course, through setting out policies and objectives for renewable energy. And this is contained in a full chapter, as Naomi alluded to. Um, so I'll touch on what's included in that chapter, the Renewable Energy Strategy chapter. And then finally, within that Renewable Energy Strategy, one of the key elements is the Wind Energy Strategy. And this is published as an appendix to the plan. And then the main points of that appendix are brought through into the text of the plan. So as the last element of this presentation, I'll explain the methodology behind the drafting of the Wind Energy Strategy in detail. So just to set the scene, the government has identified climate change as the most important long term challenge facing Ireland. And as a matter of fact, it was declared a climate and biodiversity emergency by the Iraq this in 2019. So this context very much provides the backdrop for the making of this draft plan. So looking at the legislative and policy framework, the main piece of legislation governing climate action is the Climate Action and Low Carbon Development Act in 2015. And this gave statutory authority to both the National Mitigation Plan and the Adaptation Framework. Now, what's, what's the difference between those two terms? I had to confirm them for myself. So simplest terms, mitigation tackles the causes and adaptation tackles the effects. So the 2017 mitigation plan was a whole of government plan, included over 100 individual actions for ministers and public bodies. And then the adaptation framework specified the national strategy for the application of adaptation measures in different sectors and by local authorities. And a key action under the NAF was that each local authority must prepare a local climate adaptation strategy. And an update to this contextual framework is that some of you may have heard about the Supreme Court case during summer last year that the Friends of the Irish Environment won. 
and the Supreme Court held that the 2017 National Mitigation Plan did not provide enough detail about how the state would reduce greenhouse gas emissions and therefore the entire plan should be quashed. So following on from that decision, an amendment bill to the Act was published in October 2020. This will, once adopted, introduce a requirement for all local authorities to prepare individual climate action plans, which will include both mitigation and adaptation measures. So Kilkenny County Council's climate change adaptation strategy forms part of the national adaptation framework and provides a crucial local policy input into the making of the draft plan. So the last key piece of policy context is the climate action plan, which the government published in 2019. And this plan set out 183 actions, which for the first time show how Ireland will reach its 2030 targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and also put us on the right trajectory towards net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And one of these actions, see number 65 there, um, was to adopt stronger climate action policies in relation to the patterns and forms of future development. So that very much relates to the development plan and we have strived to achieve, achieve this by integrating climate change into the development plan. How do we do this? Um, as Naomi mentioned, climate change is now front and centre as it forms an entire chapter two of the plan. This sets out the framework as to how the plan is addressing climate change. And then on top of that, climate change policies are also integrated into all sections of the plan through that list there, as you can see, it touches on all those elements. So the headings are set out there and some of the key concepts around those include compact growth. So that's really reducing emissions through compact growth, focusing on brownfield land, on infill sites in the city, in the towns. And this really, in a nutshell, compact growth reduces the need to travel and that reduces emissions. Secondly, looking there, transport. Um, this is really integrating, again, land use and transportation policy to reduce the need to travel and to encourage a move, a modal shift towards active travel, such as cycling or walking. And Nicholas will speak to that after this presentation. Um, flood resilience there, just uh, a strategic flood risk assessment was carried out as part of this plan, as part of the strategic environmental assessment. Um, and that ensures that flood risk is taken into account wherever it may be an issue. And then in relation to biodiversity and natural heritage, biodiversity is vulnerable to climate change. However, it does also offer opportunities for both mitigation and adaptation. And the draft plan has numerous measures to encourage the provision of green infrastructure within the county, particularly in Chapter 9 Heritage. And again, that will be discussed at Monday's, the, the next meeting on Monday. Um, and finally, then, one of the key ways is the ch renewable energy strategy, which is contained with the plan. So I'll, I'll, that's Chapter 11, and I'm going to turn to look at that in more detail now. So the target as set out in our renewable energy strategy is ambitious. So the government target is to increase electricity generated from renewable sources to 70% by 2030. And we are working towards a 100% target. And this target has been agreed with and will be achieved with in conjunction with them, um, three CEA, our local energy agency. Um, just to say that chapter 11 includes an, anal an analysis of all the different types of renewable energy within the county. And it breaks each type of renewable energy down and then covers three aspects, an analysis of the resource potential, an outline of the development management guidelines, including the potential impacts of the renewable energy, and then sets out policies and objectives for their future development. So just to touch on a couple of those types of renewable energy, the, the renewable energy source that most people might think of is, of course, wind energy, but there are many other sources, and these include bioenergy. And that's energy extracted from biomass, which includes biological materials such as plants and animals, wood, agricultural residue and waste. And the bioenergy is produced through many different processes, combustion and anaerobic digestion being the most common. And that photo there is actually of the Camp Hill community in Ballytobin, 
um, where they have an anaerobic digester, which performs a digestion of farm slurry with mixed food waste. And this generates energy in the form of heat and power to meet the requirements of the over 90 people living there. Hydroelectricity then is electricity derived from the power harnessed from the flow of falling water. Um, and there were four hydro schemes in Kilkenny identified in a 2010 three CEA report, and that's Inch Mills on the Sign Road in Kilkenny, um, Greenville Mill down in Kilmacow, and two, um, two plants utilising a hydropower station in Bennett's Bridge, which is the milling plant, and then the drying plant for Nicholas Moss. Turning then to solar, so solar, we've all heard of it, they can be used in buildings to produce hot water and electricity. So that's in the form of either thermal solar energy, which is passive and active, or photovoltaic solar energy. And passive solar heating refers to the way in which buildings are designed to maximise solar gain and to minimise heat loss. And then active solar energy is where solar panels are used to transform solar energy into heat to provide space and or water heating. Photovoltaic solar electricity can be generated at various scales, ranging from domestic there on the left to utility scale there on the right. And such utility scale photovoltaic arrays, they're connected to the national grid and they're what we refer to typically as solar farms. So we may all have heard of that new type of farming practice. A good example of industrial scale solar generation is O'Shea Farms or Iverk Projects down in Piltown. And they've ex placed extensive solar arrays on the roof of their agricultural sheds. And you can see them there on the right hand side, pretty much covering both of those large sheds. Geothermal energy then refers to heat energy stored in the ground. And there are various source of, sources of pumps which can extract the heat. Um, so you'll hear of ground source heat pumps, water source heat pumps or air source heat pumps. And this heat can be used to heat the spaces in buildings, heat water or enable a building to be cooled, not usually in the Irish climate. Um, looking then at sustainability and energy efficiency in buildings, according to the EU in 2002, buildings accounted for 40 percent of total energy consumption in the union. So increasing energy efficiency in buildings has a huge role to play in meeting Ireland's renewable energy targets. Those requirements are largely set out in the building regulations, part L, but our draft plan requires that all planning applications be accompanied by a provisional BER cert, so building energy rating cert, stating that the proposed dwelling is in accordance with the current building regs. And what this means is that the concepts and thinking around sustainability and energy efficiency in buildings is brought to the forefront and not added in as an afterthought at the end of the design process. So that's a very quick roundup of the, the various type of renewables. So I'll move on now, just looking in detail at the, the wind energy strategy. So looking first at the policy context, guidelines on wind energy, wind energy were first published um, in 1996, and these were then superseded by the 2006 guidelines there on the left. Um, these guidelines intended to ensure a consistency of approach throughout the country in relation to the identification of suitable locations for wind energy and the treatment and planning applications for wind energy development. So really just consistency across all local authorities. In 2017, the middle one there, interim guidelines were published. They didn't replace the 2006 guidelines, but they added additional requirements for local authorities when considering policies relating to wind energy. And this includes that the wind energy strategy indicates how the implementation of the relevant plan over its period will contribute to realising overall national targets on renewable energy and climate change mitigation. And in particular, wind energy production and the potential wind energy resource. And then very recently, draft guidelines were published in 2019. They're only draft, but they do address a number of key aspects such as noise, visual amenity setback, shadow flicker, community consultation obligations, community dividend and grid connections. And chapter three in that document sets out what a development plan needs to include. And this includes a step by step approach to identifying suitable locations for wind energy development, i.e. the wind strategy. So that's what we've followed. 
So the step by step approach, there's four steps. The approach is based on what we call CIV mapping analysis, which uses geographical information systems or GIS to layer up the various policy considerations. So mapping all those policy considerations and then combining them so that the constraints and the opportunities can be identified easily. And the strategic environmental assessment and the appropriate assessment of the draft plan also informed this CIV mapping methodology by highlighting significant environmental issues. So the first step is to assess the areas of wind potential. And there is the strategic, um, the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland have published a wind atlas for Ireland, which models those wind speeds. So there are a number of factors which influence commercial wind farm viability, including wind speeds, price of electricity, distance from the grid, and the height and the number of turbines to be located on the site. And all of those factors, apart from the wind speeds, are subject to continuous change. So the available wind speed is actually a key factor in determining the economic viability of potential wind energy locations. And wind speed increases with height above ground. So for the purposes of this strategy, we mapped wind speeds measured at 75 metres above ground level. So that map there shows across the county the wind speeds, so increasing it, it from orange through red, 7.5 metres per second being orange and anything above that then turning to a red. And you can see in general that the areas of the highest wind speeds correspond with the areas of the highest elevation. Step two then is the evaluation of landscape sensitivity. So we layer up these maps. So we have a 2003 landscape character assessment of the county prepared by CAS consultants, and this identified three areas of highly scenic and significant amenity value, and they're shown there in figure two. And they, those areas are Brandon Hill uplands and the river valleys. And they're considered extremely sensitive to wind energy development. In addition to those, um, the area of Spa Hill and Clamanta in the northwest is one of the potential archaeological landscape sites that we've identified for the first time in the draft plan. And um, parts of the Spa Hill site are also designated as an SAC and an NHA. There's a view there as well. So we've also added this is this area in as an exclusion area, in addition to the highly scenic areas identified in the 2003 document. We also added in the designations in any neighbouring local authorities if they had any particular um, sensitivities. Step three then grabs all of that information um, in combination with every heritage, archaeological and amenity designation in the development plan and in addition to um, taking account of existing settlements. So I'll go through that table in detail, but first of all, just to say the guidelines state that the designation of an area for protection of natural or built heritage does not automatically preclude wind energy development. However, considering the extent of the land in the county identified as having an extensive wind energy resource greater than or equal to 7.5 metres per second, excluding those areas of natural or cultural heritage, wouldn't impact on the ability of the county to meet its renewable targets. So the approach taken is to exclude all of these areas due to the potential effects on their sensitivities. So they fall under either natural heritage designations or landscape designations. And the natural heritage ones are SACs, which are special areas of conservation designated at both EU and national level. Um, SPAs, special protection areas, again, designated at EU and national level. Um, natural heritage areas, which are a national designation, geological sites. Um, and then the landscape designations are highly scenic areas, which I've just gone through. They're Brandon and the river valleys. And then also areas of cultural heritage or archaeological heritage. And just to state on that, for the first time in this draft plan, we have identified archaeological landscapes. Um, Three in particular have been picked out for protection and they are Freestone Hill um, near Kilkenny City with the lone Hawthorn sitting or fairy tree sitting on the top that you can see from the old um, Carlow Road and the M9. 
Tory Hill in the south and then the Lingon River Valley on the border with Tip as well under the shadow of Schlievenaman. And these archaeological landscapes have specific policy protections in the development plan, but they're also added in to the sieve mapping layer as a layer of exclusion. So in addition to the natural and landscape layers that I've gone through, the guidelines recommend that settlements be excluded as there's a 500 metre setback anyway from any residence. So of course the settlement will be, 500 metres within any settlement will be excluded. So we added that into the layers and then all of those layers that I've just gone through are coloured in grey and they show you basically the exclusion areas for wind energy developments. And the yellow then is the optimal areas for wind. Well, sorry, the yellow then is any area that is not excluded. So step four then, add in the information regarding accessibility to the electricity grid. And that's just to establish where wind energy resources are readily capable of development due to access to the grid and access to substations. But of course, proximity, it's only one factor um, influencing accessing the, the transmission network. So the black line there is the 110 kilovolt, the 220 is the bright green running through the south of the county, and the purple lines there, the fainter lines there, the 38 kilovolt line. We also had to look at the policies of adjoining authorities because we don't want a mismatch between any juxtaposition between their strategies and our strategies, of course, at a county border that we need to take account of theirs and they need to take account of ours. So that just is a quick snapshot of Waterford's um, strategy. The red is no go, the green is open for consideration, the blue is preferred and the yellow is strategic. And you can see along the border with Kilkenny there to the north of Waterford County, um, it's, it's designated as green, which is open for consideration. So we will, this is an ongoing process as Naomi has outlined, we're just in the, the draft stage at the moment. And as we go through the process, we will continue to consult with our neighbouring authorities and there may well be changes as, as they are producing their draft plans at the moment and as they receive comments and submissions to their draft plans. The location of existing and permitted wind farms is also mapped, just recognising the investment made by private developers, ESB and Airgrid in terms of site access roads and electricity infrastructure and they're just shown there. Finally then, after an extensive process, layering up all those maps, the resulting map shows three policy areas. So the green there is acceptable in principle, the very faint yellow is open for consideration and the grey is the not normally permissible. And the difference between acceptable in principle and open for consideration is the scale of wind energy development that we would consider in those areas. This table is actually in the, the what I've just talked through mainly forms the appendix to the plan. This table is actually taken from chapter 11 of the plan. And this breaks down scales of wind energy developments into five different categories. First is individual turbines where a landowner may wish to harness wind energy for private use, <clears throat> excuse me, planning applications for individual wind turbines subject to a limit of one per holding um, will be considered everywhere in the county. Second producer there is auto producer. And that just means where an industry or a large energy user like a Glambia uses a wind turbine to feed its own energy consumption. Third and fourth there are the community schemes, which where there's a community involvement in the wind farm development and a small scale wind farm. They tend to be one and the same, um, as in a community led scheme tends to be small scale. Um, and this is where there's no greater than five turbines and total capacity is not greater than five megawatts. And additionally, turbine heights don't exceed 65 meters to hub height. So small scale and community led, they would be considered in either the yellow or the green areas. The last category then is large scale wind farm and that's greater than five megawatts and they in usual circumstances will only be considered in the green areas. So just touching on a topical issue at the moment, 
um, planning applications for certain large scale private development, generally of a class which require environmental impact assessment and which Onboard Planola certifies as meeting required criteria, those applications can be made direct to the board. Um, and the first such strategic infrastructure development, which it's called in County Kilkenny for a 21 number wind turbine farm in Castle Banny is now actually lodged with the board um, for their assessment and submissions can be made to the board at the moment and um, the closing date on that is the 26th of March. So as I said, I've just run through the methodology, but the chapter itself includes a rake of requirements in relation to what any application for a wind energy development must include their environmental assessments, the details of community engagement and participation, details of grid connection and examination of the geology and ground conditions, looking at the site drainage, hydrological effects and um, specifically landscape and visual impact assessment. Um, and that includes setbacks, which, as I said, the 500 metres is mandatory. And then there's also a requirement for a minimum distance of four times the tip height should apply between the, a wind turbine and the nearest point of the curtilage of any residence. So they're all set out in chapter 11 of the plan, if you want to look at them in more detail. Um, and that's it. My closing comments are it's just that was a total whistle stop tour of renewable energy strategy and climate change. Um, but if you take a look at chapter 11 and the wind strategy appendix, examine the issues that we're going to talk about here tonight. And um, I would encourage you then to make a submission by the 12th of March. Thank you. Thanks very much, Katrina. That was Katrina O'Sullivan, who's executive planner with Kilkenny. County Council taking us through the aspects of the plan dealing with renewable energy. Now, I'm sure it's very uh, topical and it's very important, one of the most important issues of our time. So if you have questions, uh, you'll have an opportunity later on uh, following our next presentation to ask those. And I would encourage you to use the, the chat function at the uh, side of your screen. Uh, you'll see the icon at the top of your screen. It's like a speech bubble. Um, and if you would like to make your presentation in person or you'd like to verbally put a question to one of the members of the Kilkenny County Council team on any aspect of this evening, you can raise your hand, which is the icon at the top of your screen in the shape of a hand, funnily enough. Uh, just a message in um, from Minister Malcolm Noonan, uh, who uh, has asked Lawrence Do Doyle to pass on his apologies as he's unable to attend this evening due to a prior uh, engagement and he sends his best wishes and says he's committed to monitoring the progress of the plan as it proceeds and uh, Lawrence will be filling in uh, the minister tomorrow so we thank Lawrence for that and we thank Minister Noonan for his uh, good wishes. Um, next we're going to have Nicholas Lowe who's going to talk to us about the movement and mobility strategy which is all part of the plan and he'll start uh, like his first slide says by filling in the national context. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Nicholas. Nice to see positive messages coming in uh, to Katrina. So thank you for those. Keep your messages coming. After this, we'll have a questions and answer uh, session. Uh, but in the meantime, I'll hand you over to Nicholas, who will take you through uh, the movement and mobility sections of the plan. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'm just going to start the presentation there. <clears throat> um, I think um, it's appropriate for me to start at a national level to discuss the transport strategy. We actually refer to it as the movement and mobility strategy. Um, now, if we look at the national strategic outcomes of the national planning framework, there's three very uh, important outcomes, which I think relates to the, all, the whole issue of sustainability uh, and of transport. Firstly, uh, compact growth there, number one. Number four, sustainable mobility. And then number eight, transition to a low carbon and climate resilient society. So um, I'm going to hang the whole strategy on that. Uh, and as, I, as uh, So what is the plan strategic aim? Uh, we are trying to better coordinate and integrate transport and land use planning. We're trying to reduce the demand for travel and the reliance on the private car. 
uh, Katrina referred earlier on to uh, the modal shift, and I'll, I'll speak on that later. Uh, we, we need to favor our public transport, cycling and walking, promote and facilitate the transition to electrification of our transport modes, and move away from carbon intensive modes to new technologies, such as electric vehicles. And how are we going to achieve this shift? Firstly, by prioritizing walking, cycling and public transport throughout our towns and cities, uh, and by achieving compact growth, which is maximizing the number of people living and walking, uh, living within walking and cycling distance of neighborhood centers, public transport services, and other services such as local schools. On the right hand side there, you will see uh, that's come from the design manual on urban roads and streets. Um, it is the, the priority, pedestrians first at the top, then cyclists, public transport, and then last, the private vehicle. Uh, the second uh, way to achieve it is designing better permeability for walking and cycling in new developments. Uh, now, these are for new applications that come in. Uh, we have to make sure that permeability is a priority. Uh, we also hope to retrospectively implement walking and cycling facilities uh, and uh, design better permeability and maybe retrospectively implement permeability. But as you know, it's very that's very difficult. I'm just going to show you a picture here. Um, this is actually the Eurospar in Kilkenny, and you'll see there Lintown view. Um, at the, the red dot, you, you'll see there uh, right next to the roundabout. That's a good example um, of how far somebody has to walk just to uh, get to the other side of the fence. And if they had an accessible uh, entrance there into the estate, uh, they'd have, they, they wouldn't need to potentially uh, use any other modes of, of, of transport, like uh, some people might actually get in the car just to drive that, that's, that short distance. Um, so we are trying to retros retrospectively uh, look at how to best uh, implement uh, better permeability, but the best way to do it is to, to look at new applications that come in. Unfortunately, new applications uh, have in the past uh, pri primarily been uh, small pockets of development and they're, they're kind of isolated developments and, and you will find that uh, continuity is sometimes a problem, uh, especially where people propose uh, to create a, their own character for their own estate, put up high walls and fences, etc. Um, this is uh, an assessment that was done by our consultants for our uh, city transport plan. And this is just uh, indicating barriers to permeability throughout Kilkenny City, for instance. And as you can see, they're significant. They're major roads, uh, walls, uh, fences, etc. And uh, so that, that makes it difficult for, for people to, to find a direct line, the shortest route to wherever they want to go. So uh, for the county, uh, how are we going to, uh, what are the objectives? Is to deliver us on sustainable mobility, with an accompanying investment in infrastructure to provide for the integration between all modes of transport. Um, very important, we have uh, we have rails, rail, bus services. Um, uh, they are not joined up. Uh, we have the NTA currently looking at rural transport, and we're working with them to try and 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 a better joint up thinking, more reliable service, more frequently, etc. Uh, then also in combination with Waterford City and County Council and the NTA mm -hmm. and TII, we uh, propose to undertake a metropolitan area transport strategy, uh, which applies to the MASP area, Metropolitan Area Strategic Plan, uh, which applies to the Ferry Bank area of Kilkenny. Uh, that's underway. We're currently doing some technical work on that. Um, and then also uh, to compile a cycling strategy for the county. Uh, we are going to appraise each district town to determine measures to promote walking and cycling. I know that there are mobility management plans currently underway in several of these district uh, towns and uh, where we have local area plans, it's also an objective to undertake those. And then to provide better cycle collect, uh, connections to the Kilkenny Greenway, which uh, is uh, currently under construction. The most important however, is to achieve a modal shift away from the private car towards walking and cycling and to implement strategies to get that modal shift going within the lifetime of this plan. 
Uh, below you can see table 12.1, uh, an extract from the plan. You will see that uh, cycling in 2016 was only 1.2% throughout the county, walking was 11%. Uh, public transport eight, and you can see the car predominated at 65%. The objective uh, we have set for 2040 uh, in the current plan is uh, to increase the walking by to 20%, cycling to 15, uh, and public transport to 20, and to reduce the car reliance to only 45%. When we look at Kilkenny City, uh, this is a, an extract from the, 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 the plan, the core strategy map. You will see, uh, if you can see my cursor, you probably won't. You can see there's, uh, there's five areas within the city. Uh, the built up areas, New Park, the city center and Loch Boy, um, they are fairly well connected. The new proposed areas, Loch Macask and the Brega Valley, um, they will need future conne uh, connections. And if I if I show you the existing cycling facilities, you can see that there's a, a lack of balance in the city at the moment uh, with the the uh, the east of the city uh, towards the Dublin Road being fairly well provided with infrastructure. The west, uh, it, it fades uh, away into the west uh, and obviously the new uh, built up uh, or, or the new neighborhoods haven't been uh, built out. So that's where the, the focus will be in future. This is to give you an indication of uh, pedestrian volumes at present. Um, you will see there uh, the city centre. There's quite a, a good bit of pedestrianisation there, but as you as you go towards the edges, it's fairly low. You can see at the AM peak, less than 20 uh, movements uh, in any particular peak uh, in the yellow areas, which is which is fairly low. Uh, you can see there also the the brown area is John Street. That's where the most pedestrian movement takes place in the city. Uh, similarly, if you look at cycling, um, very low volumes. Uh, the, the yellow is less than eight movements. Uh, and then the brown uh, is, 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 is more than 40 units uh, uh, movements. Um, still very low, uh, especially given the existing infrastructure uh, around the eastern part of the city. So the modal share for Kilkenny City itself um, in 2020, uh, it was uh, projected in the, by our consultants that uh, the walking currently is about 26%, uh, cycling 3% or near 4%, uh, public transport just below 7 and the car still 62%. Our target for 2040 is uh, to uh, increase walking to 35%, cycling to at least 10%, and public transport to 15%. You're all aware of the fact uh, that we now have a bus service in Kilkenny, and we hope to uh, to improve on that and build that out over the next few years uh, to uh, form with more routes and, and potentially a, a wider catchment, uh, depending on its success, of course, and, and, and the availability of funding. Uh, Hopefully, we can reduce car dependency down from 62 to 40 percent over the, the same period. So the focus of our of the city, uh, focus for the city is uh, to create compact growth and as we call it, the 10 minute city. It's a concept that is being used in some of the bigger cities as well. I think they talk about 15 minute cities depending on uh, how far you can get on, on, on the underground, etc. I know Paris is, for, is, a, is, is aiming to be a 15 minute city. Uh, Kilkenny, we're focusing on walking and cycling uh, times. So the intention is to create, uh, to be able to reach anywhere in the city, uh, where you work, where you go to school, where you play, where you shop, within 10 minutes, either walking or cycling. So. In order to, to achieve that, we need a balanced compact form combined with efficient transport links between employment and residential locations and uh, to facilitate easier circulation and mobility. Uh, the basis of all of this remains compact growth. Now for Kilkenny City, in order to uh, achieve this, we are currently undertaking uh, a local transport plan for the city. A draft would uh, be available, I'd say, by the middle of the year. 
and uh, we will then go out on public consultation on that as well and people can give their inputs. Uh, we think it's a very exciting uh, uh, plan. Um, so we need we need to develop this 10 minute city framework um, and, and map the infrastructural requirements to achieve the, the 10 minute city and uh, then to also undertake the, the appropriate traffic management measures to reduce congestion and to, 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 to be able to, uh, to, to move around more easily. We hope to invest in cycling and other smart travel projects to support the compact 10 minute city. Uh, as part of the uh, city plan, there will be uh, a cycling strategy, which they are the, the consultants are working on at the moment, and a walking strategy. And following on from these strategies, we hope to, to improve the walking and cycling infrastructure in the city. And the investment will depend on, on, on this, the recommendations from those studies. Development management measures, uh, work tra workplace travel plans. Uh, when an applicant for uh, a significant employer comes uh, in with a planning application, uh, we will consider uh, or request a workplace travel plan to make sure that the, uh, the I suppose the workforce that their travel arrangements are optimal, that they're shared, uh, that, that there's a provision for them to use public transport, etc. Those who can walk and cycling to identify their needs as well. Uh, there is going to be a parking standard shift. Um, there's a requirement from National that we that we look at maximum parking standards for non-residential developments, whereas in the past we would have looked at minimum standards, especially in the city centre. Um, we find that uh, you know it is sometimes very difficult for for uh, developments to meet those minimum standards, and they are not always, uh, I suppose, productive because they they tend to draw more cars into the city. Two percent of all new space uh, parking spaces will be age friendly, and will comply with uh, universal design standards, and then all uh, up to ten percent of new residential um, parking spaces will be allocated for electric vehicles and they must be able to and the rest must be able to accommodate uh, future charging points are very important. Uh, we're also going to insist on uh, universal design standards. We as a council already apply that in all the public realm projects, roads, footpaths, bus, bus shelters. We're, uh, we're in the process of planning a few bus shelters now for the new uh, the bus service and uh, we are making sure that universal design standards are, are being met for those. Um, that in general is how we intend to, to make uh, transport more sustainable throughout the county and the city. Um, as I said, uh, a lot of that will hinge on the city local transport plan, which is currently being developed. Um, the, the, the chapters, uh, the transport uh, movement and mobility uh, chapters in the plans have quite a lot of information. You can peruse that at your own in at your own time, and look at the uh, the projects, the objectives. Um, there's quite a few objectives for for roads and uh, pedestrianisation around uh, the city, uh, two two additional pedestrian bridges across the river, etc. Uh, the intention tonight was not to discuss those, but just to look at the the paradigm shift, as I suppose. Um, you know how we intend to go forward. So, uh, John, back to you. Nicholas, thanks very much. That was Nicholas Lowe uh, giving us a, a detailed presentation on uh, how it's envisaged that the modal shift will take place. And we all agree, well, I, I hope we all agree that such a dramatic change in behaviour is essential in the coming uh, years. And we can't talk in terms of years. It needs to start taking place uh, pretty soon and even now. Um, a number of comments and questions coming in. We'll try to get to them all. I'm not, uh, there's the team here from Kilkenny County Council, so some of them uh, may take one or two to, to answer, but there's a question uh, which came in from Aidan Collins. It's, uh, it refers to the 50 megawatt limit for SID relating to wind, and he wonders if there are anything similar, uh, any other uh, implications in relation to solar. I'm not too sure who could answer that from Kilkenny County Council. Uh, is that something? Uh, Dennis? Or hi, John. Actually, I Katrina, just yeah. hi, uh, Katrina oh, here. Um, I yeah. just responded in the um, text box there. I had to I had to look it up. I must admit, 
But oh. I gave Aidan there the details of the act. So it does state that any industrial installation for the production of electricity, steam or hot water with a heat output of 300 megawatts or more would qualify as um, SID. OK, I hope that uh, clarifies uh, that for you, Aidan. Um, there's a question in from uh, Kira Comboy Fisher. Um, uh, and it says, I'm wondering if the WES has designated sufficient lands as preferred to reach the ambitious targets of 100% renewable electricity, considering onshore wind is currently the greatest contributor and the high attrition rates associated with wind farm development. Uh, so I don't, is that? Yeah, could, maybe I'd take that, John. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, one of, one of the things uh, in making that ambitious target, we did consult extensively with um, the three, uh, the Carroll Energy, I'm sorry, the three counties energy agency there. So it's not something that we pick, picked out of the air at a randomly. So we wanted to be ambitious. So we've done a, a good bit of background work in that. And uh, we would, from the figures that we've uh, calculated with the, the, the three counties energy agency we'd be confident that with that land uh, that land area designated that between all the different forms of renewable energies that that hundred percent can be achieved but otherwise i suppose we wouldn't we wouldn't have stipulated but uh, otherwise so we're confident that yeah certainly that will be achieved and i suppose it's important uh, just to remember <clears throat> that at a local level uh, there is an obligation on us by the cent from central government and from the, uh, the office of the planning regulator that each local authority is seen to uh, being to be contributing to the national targets uh, uh, of renewable energy so that's our contribution in terms of um, the 100 percent electricity demand so just remember that it's carefully it is carefully worded too in the context of it's 100 percent of electricity demand it's not 100 percent of all energy demand. Okay. So you're, you're confident, Dennis, that there's sufficient land designated? Uh, yes, as absolutely. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> there was a bit of debate um, about permeability there and the meaning of it um, in the comment section. Hopefully, you're all keeping your eye on the comment section on the right hand side. Uh, Nicholas, you were talking about it. Hopefully, the example you gave in relation to Eurospar uh, kind of brought it to life, but could you just give us a, a bit of detail on on permeability? I suppose it 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 is the ability for people to flow, you know, or, or to, to to walk from one uh, neighborhood to a ne to a next uh, without any hindrance, without obstacles. Um, so uh, people living in in some of the uh, outlying estates sometimes have to uh, take a, a roundabout route to get to the city center, whereas if the neighboring estates were more permeable and led through people, um, then there should there would be shorter uh, routes for people to get to the city center, for instance, and that um, and 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 that would potentially take people out of their cars because they have to take a roundabout route. They decide well, it's too far for me to walk, um, even though as the crow flies, it might be might be quite short. Uh, but they'll just get in the car because it's 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 not it's not uh, easily reachable. And I don't know if that answers the question, but uh, yeah, that question came from Ronan. I think I saw you raising your hand earlier, Ronan. Is that the case? If you'd like to uh, ask a supplemental, um, please feel free to turn off your mic and you can uh, have the floor. <coughs> Hello. I don't see Ronan there. No. OK, we'll take I'll take that that we're going to uh, move on a question in from Tony Musial. I hope I've uh, pronounced her surname correctly there, Tony. If not, apologies. Uh, Tony writes, the Lingon Valley is designated as excluded from wind turbine development. However, it appears that there is a thin sliver of land stretching from Calamary Nine Mile House to Wine Gap slash Tullahocht that will be acceptable to a larger scale <laughs> turbines of 65 metres. These will wreck the unique views from sites such as not row, uh, he says. Um, given this is a small sliver with such a high visual impact to an area with active tourism and heritage, can this be revisited? It seems to permit destruction of the essence of the area 
when many other areas are more suitable. So that's uh, from Tony. I'm not too sure, uh, Dennis, yeah. uh, is that one for you? As yeah. I understood it, that's currently with on board Planal, is that correct? Uh, no, that's... Uh, Sorry. You're, you're getting crossed, crossed wires there, little John. Okay, apologies. So, um, <clears throat> in relation to Lingon Valley, yes, we've had some um, interaction on this, some emails and submissions already, I think, from the, the public in relation to Lingon Valley. And, uh, we're, we're, we're aware, as Katrina referred to in her uh, assessment, one in her presentation, the um, the landscape down there in terms of Knock Row and and, uh, and the Ningon Valley is something that we've identified uh, as a unique, uh, a, unique, unique type of, of archaeological landscape. So definitely that can be and, and will be revisited. So in terms of of the the, the protection of that heritage. You know, it's important and it's a good example actually of, you know, conflicting objectives and how the local authority has to manage those. And what I mean by conflicting objectives. So on the one hand, we're tasked with, uh, you know, promoting uh, national targets on wind energy development and renewable energies, <clears throat> which is what we have tried to do through the wind energy strategy. But also it's mandatory through the, the planning legislation to protect our heritage and protect archaeological uh, heritage. So it's trying to manage those two objectives. So you have two <clears throat> objectives, two worthy objectives, but in the, in a local situation, then you come to a situation where there's a conflict in this location. So we have to be sure that we can do both in a in a reasonable manner without impinging on, on either the heritage and still allowing a, you know sufficient space for wind energy development to happen. So we're quite conscious of that interrelationship that goes under with the Lingon Valley and with the Knock Road uh, Passage Tomb and so on and the other monuments in that location. And it's something we will be looking at again in a bit more detail. Okay, Tom. Uh, <coughs> I hope, Tony, that went some way towards uh, addressing your question. Yes, it did. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, Ronan Daly, uh, who asked earlier on about permeability, just makes a comment that it's excellent to see the 10 minute city featured and it's very possible in Kilkenny. Uh, Lucy Glendening has uh, said that it's great to see so much emphasis again on getting people away from the private car. And so she, she said again, she wonders why the council applied for car park in the middle of Kilkenny city for 128 cars and eight coaches into an area that already has traffic congestion problems <coughs> and the air quality issues associated with excess motor vehicles. I suppose I think, Dennis, you answered that question at a previous meeting. Yeah, that, that came up. Go with, through uh, that the, again. Yeah, so just to explain uh, again. So it, the car park referred to is a, 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 car, a car park that was recently given temporary permission uh, on the Abbey Quarter site. So it's a site that has been actually it's not in the ownership of the council any longer. It's been transferred to the partnership, which is developing the, the Abbey Quarter. So it's the Abbey Quarter partnership applied and, and the council. So it, and the basis of that is around the master planning that has been done for that site and the urban design guidance that has been done for the site. So again, just to, to repeat myself from the previous night, it's a significant site in the middle of the city. It's going to take a number of years uh, to develop out that site in its entirety and you know the recognition that you could put uh, temporary or meanwhile uses in on the site while the rest of it other proposals are being developed so again just to give you a an indication of the time frames there again you know it was first uh, brought into the into public ownership back in 2012 when uh, uh, when uh, Glambi or not Glambi sorry when Diageo announced they were coming out of the out of the brewing, centralizing the brewing operations to the Dublin city. It then, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in, the up, in the following three years, then we developed up the master plan. And the year after that, the urban design strategy. So it took us, you know, there was a good bit of public interaction. It took us four years to get that. And then we've been moving on to the projects based around that. So you have at the moment, the brew house um, nearing completion. You'll have the the uh, new library going to start later in the year as well in the old Mayfair building. So in that context, there's still a, a significant amount of the site to be developed. And, you know, this will be a, a use that can, that can benefit, you know, the city 
in the short term. So for instance, the, the, the bus parking there, it has been a long standing objective to be able to have an, a, an alternative to the castle road where the bus buses park at the moment. And then, you know, trying to get tourists and visitors down through the medieval mile from the castle to St. Kansas. So that's one of the objectives there. And as I said, on Monday night, this is a short term, you know, a short term use on the site while development proposals are being um, uh, developed, but developments are being formulated for the rest of the site and shouldn't be seen in the context of the long term strategy of the transition from, you know, car based to more sustainable modes of transport. So, you know, the, 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 the modal shift is going to take some years. So you saw from Nicholas's figures there, we're quite low on, on cycling or walking and we need to up that. But that's a, a period of transition. So uh, that's the rationale behind the car parking. OK, Dennis, Lucy, I uh, hope you that was, may not agree with that, but I think that's the current rationale that the council are uh, putting in relation to that. Um, I think there's a number of people, um, and Naomi, you might clarify people with their hands raised that they'd like to make inputs into the meeting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we'll, we'll start there from the bottom. Donald Deering, you have your hand raised. Yeah, um, no, I, I welcome the, the whole plan. I think it's fantastic. And I'm, I'm thinking of the 10 minutes to town. I might have, ha even have to get a faster bike, even though I have a, a sports bike. But, you know, it's uh, it's really a, a fantastic plan. But just following on what Dennis said there, and just to put a bit of context on it, uh, he's, he was talking about electricity, the 100% electricity by 2030. But I just want to put some context on this because he did say it's electricity only and sometimes people get confused because uh, the actual amount that electricity represents in terms of, I suppose, total energy presently is slightly only over 20%. So you're dealing with the 20% problem and you're neglecting, I suppose, the monster, which is the heat and the transport one you're dealing with, but the heat one is very big. And I'm just saying, and I know I discussed it with Paddy, and he knows about it, that's Paddy Phelan. Uh, you kind of have to nearly leave everything out there, like, like even things like district heating, I know Paddy has looked at it, uh, biodigestion, even um, all these, which you've already mentioned, all these are important. And in fact, you want to see positive government policies on it, which are not there, in my opinion, yet, because your planning really can only reflect what's happening at national level and sometimes there can be you know a bit of difficulty there but generally overall other than that i welcome it thank you good thank you very much okay i'm gonna um we have a lot of questions uh, going in so i'm gonna ask people uh both on the answers and for the questions to keep it as quick as possible great to see so much engagement um uh, Mairead asks, can she put a question about future plans for the ring road, for the road infrastructure outside the ring road? Nicholas, I suppose you were talking about transportation and so on. So is that something you can address? You're muted there, Nicholas. Nicholas, yeah. I, sorry. OK, John, Nicholas, coming in. John, oh, sorry. Go, go ahead. Oh yeah, so I suppose it's it's a brilliant plan and it's it's Who's great. Who's this to... speaking? Sorry. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Oh, Mairead, how are you? Go on. Oh sorry. Will I go ahead? Well, do you want Nicholas to answer the question yeah. first? Yeah. Could I ask more specifically? Just I suppose I'm. I, it's a great plan. It's you know really positive and it's great to see the emphasis on cycling. I suppose keywords Nicholas you mentioned were connectivity, permeability, getting people out of cars, and I suppose one road that we all know does not facilitate any of that is the road between Dunmore Village and 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 Kilkenny and the proposed Dunmore Amenity Park and Kilkenny City. And I really think it could be a huge amenity to Kilkenny if we had footpaths and cycle paths on that road out to Dunmore, out to the Amenity Park. There's a huge volume of housing estates right inside that ring road. And you know you talk about permeability, that's the that's the quickest way out, you know. So I wonder, has that been looked at or, you know, where things are there? OK, Nicholas. Uh, yes, I can try to answer that. I think this was dealt with uh, at the last meeting by Dennis as well. Um, the, the road is in charge of Transport uh, Infrastructure Ireland, 
And uh, so the council will be working with them to try and and, and to prioritize, I suppose, uh, uh, walking and cycling where possible along this road. <coughs> I think, Dennis, I, I don't know if you yeah, have more information. So, on, yeah, on so just again, just to to um, refresh on on the last night. So the, the project itself, the amenity park there, uh, that's still going through its part eight process. But uh, the emphasis will be on, uh, and I think I mentioned this the last night as well, uh, the emphasis will be using the bleach road as a as a, a, a connector for cycling. So at the moment, that's a designated cycle, uh, county cycle route. And with the emphasis for that, any for the moment will be on that on that link from from the top of Green Hill out through the bleach road and out to the to the, uh, to like the the bleach road entrance to the amenity park. So that that will connect in then to the River Valley Park, the River Nor Valley Park, and the other um, the other best Could I just ask that side. to mute themselves? It's just great. Uh, uh, I don't know so, who done. Okay, Dennis, continue. Yeah. Yeah. So I was saying in, in the current format, the proposal is to uh, encourage the cycling to ca happen on the bleach road from town out to the, which is a much safer route and a, you know a, a, a lightly trafficked county road. There isn't a proposal there at the moment, a firm proposal to upgrade the N77. So as uh, Nicholas said to said to it. Uh, the N77 is a national route at the moment, so anything that we do there would have to be done in agreement with TII and of course funding for that obviously would have to be uh, allocated or given over from a national national budget on that. So I think in the short term, it'd certainly be the focus will be on the bleach road as an access for cycling and walking to it. Okay. Can I, can I just say there with regard to the bleach road, I mean that's constantly flooded as it is at the moment. It wouldn't be much good these days because like it's it's not a road that's actually accessible at the moment even. And that's a common occurrence on a on a yearly basis, really. And just if I had a second question there with regard to the TII, is there any way or who gets in contact with them to actually to to express or to enable us to express our concerns or how can we do that? Well, yeah, so the TIA, as I say, a national body, so we would have an interaction uh, on a continuous basis. When I say we, the county council road design section, would it be interacting on a fairly continuous basis with TII in terms of the national roads through the through the county and the different projects that would be, uh, you know, associated with that. So, uh, for instance, in the plan, you'll see different projects that are highlighted as to be progressed during the next phase. So. At the moment, the N77 and the location that you're talking about, there isn't any particular, there isn't an emphasis on that or funding available for that at the moment. So, um, yeah, you know, these things are done in phases. Yeah, the so, ring road or the, the bleach road just would be a concern when you take the flooding into consideration. Is, has that been taken into consideration? Yes, yeah, so, the, you know, except that the, the bleach road floods from time to time and in the current period, uh, you know, it's possible that it can flood, but it's trying to balance uh, trying to balance that so like for most of the time most of the year most of the time it it doesn't flood it's only in certain certain uh, uh, periods so that's something that you know is is there so it is a, a recognized cycle route f to to the county at the moment so um we've we've taken that and to try and build on that in, in terms of that concept so um that's where we are at the moment with the cycling team. Yeah. Could, could I just add one other quick point? I know we don't want to take forever, but um, basically, you know, when you're talking direct access, people will go the quickest route to get somewhere. And the quickest route for most people is to cycle out the N77 to the biodiversity park, rather than go as far as the bleach road, cycle the bleach road and come around. And I just think it's something to be considered, if, if that's yeah. possible. Oh, Thanks, Brad. Uh, yeah, yeah, I take that point. Yeah, it is something to be considered. And it is being considered as part of the process there, yeah. Thank, thank thanks. You. OK, thanks very much, uh, folks. Um, there's an observation in from Aidan Fitzpatrick um, and a question, I suppose. It's good to see all forms of renewable energy mentioned, but he feels that the plan and the presentation seems to be wind centric. Could that be addressed? Yeah, uh, I take that. Yeah. yeah. So, um, as I say, it's uh, the plan is around the spatial allocation of, of development. So, 
in terms of the wind, it, certainly it has a big emphasis on the wind uh, energy, wind strategy, but it also does have reference to the other types of energies that are available out there. So Katrina went through that. And so, for instance, you know, hydro is mentioned, by bio, uh, bioenergy is mentioned and so on. So these will be just as easily um, uh, developable by private sectors and we have policy supporting all that. So, um, you know, there's far more, there's far more emphasis on wind, I suppose, because, uh, you, you know, that's where the investment is taking place. And that's, and it's, uh, you know, it, it has the greatest amount of return for investment. So you get a lot of the uh, investment funds looking at the potential for wind energy just because it is, it is that, um, uh, it, there is that return there and it's, it's proven as well as a return in terms of investment. Okay. So yeah, we do have, we have all, 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 all the renewable energy forms are given credence in the plan or mentioned in the plan. Wind energy does take, uh, take an emphasis there just because it has the, the greatest potential uh, as a resource within the county. Okay, um, Alex Wilston uh, puts in an observation and a, a question, I suppose, saying that there are a number of old mills along the north with potential for renewable energy projects, giving these buildings a future purpose and avoiding dereliction from a heritage perspective. And he says an objective to encourage this would be useful. Is that yeah. something that can be done or how can something like that be encouraged? Well, again, incorporated uh, I, the process? Yeah, again, hydro energy is uh, referenced in the plan, and the, the plan supports hydro energy in that context, particularly identifies that sort of situation where you have old mills. So, you know, the milling, the milling uh, history of Kilkenny is, is fairly well documented, you know, particularly along the River Noor, they, they coming out from the city, you have two old mills within the city, and then you go further out, uh, further on down at, um, uh, out at, at um, not like a strat, can't think of the name now, but out, out uh, Lavittstown out there. And then the Kings River along out by Kells, there are several mills in that, that. So all these have potential and one or two of those have been brought back into, into generating units. So for instance, Nicholas Moss mill in Bennis Bridge, he has his generator there for quite some time. So that kind of enterprise or that kind of project will be supported and is supported. OK, and, and the likelihood of an objective being included in the plan or where, where would that lie? Yeah, so I think uh, just off the top of my head, I can't remember, but I think we have an objective in the plan. Um, um, yeah, policies uh, are set out um, in Chapter 11, um, Section 11.7, .7, hydropower. OK, I hope that Alex, if you'd like to come in and say anything on that or I can't see on my screen. So I'm not hearing anything, so I'm going to move on. OK, um, I'm going to come to some of the people who got their hands raised. Um, and if uh, Catherine, I think you wish to say something. Hi, um, good evening all. My name is Catherine Peters and thank you to Naomi, uh, Katrina and Nicholas there for the great presentations. And I suppose um, uh, the last uh, couple that were on there that live uh, in Dunmore, I suppose my interest is the same. I'm living in Dunmore Village on the Coma Road, and I very much welcome the development of the Environmental Biodiversity Park here in Dunmore. But my, I suppose my concerns refer back to Naomi's and Nicholas's pre presentation on what's in the plan, uh, reducing our carbon emissions and footprint. So like for in order for us to go for a walk now we have to get in the car so we're at number four you know when you go through the procedure the pedestrian the cyclist the public transport and the private we have no choice but to jump in the car i have school going uh, secondary school going children they can't cycle uh, they can't walk um and again i suppose like i'm looking um i would love you know the path from Dunmore Village into the Castlecomer Road roundabout. I agree, and Dennis, I think you answered uh, a lot of, you know, the, the, uh, about the access to the new park, hopefully, that we will get, um, it, it, that the access would be the Bleach Road. Now, I've been on, I'd say, luckily, I suppose, you know, the mass path across the road from where I live, uh, we had it reopened, I suppose, in uh, from maybe March, the lockdown last year, 
So we have access to the Bleach Road from here. So we can go, we can walk, but we can't walk now because the road is flooded. So I took it from the other angle today and tried to walk out, but again, totally flooded. So I know it's only parts um, of the year, but you know, there's also a development pitch here in Dunmore for the GAA. Now, a lot of the players that use this pitch are underage players. So again, to reduce the carbon footprint, a lot of these players then need a parent to drop and collect them to each and every training session or match. Um, I just feel Dunmore could be used and it could open up the town an awful lot more. Uh, you know, the north of the city, uh, your Castlecomer, the Coon, the Clock, Ballyragget, you know, like it, it could be used, the facility here in Dunmore could really be used. Uh, you could have, you know, your bicycle hire from the car park here in Dunmore, the bus could come out. Now, I'm I'm not looking maybe to use the bus, I'm pushing more for it because I'm into, you know, uh, being out and the exercise and all the rest. Okay. Um. So look, that's, that's I'm sort of pushing it and, and maybe asked to ask, how can we get a uh, village status? So some mornings to get out to bring the girls to school and I leave at quarter past eight for them to be in at quarter to nine. And some mornings I could sit in the car for 10 full minutes to take a left turn on the Coma Road and you're at the mercy of the kindness of somebody else to let you out onto that road. So I just feel if we are a village, should we not have, and again, maybe it refers back to the TII, and I know when we moved out here back in 1995, um, I, I got in contact with the NRA at the time. And they said because it was, again, a national road that they couldn't reduce the speed. Again, okay. the speed. OK, so, yeah, I suppose I've yeah. gone on yeah. enough. Thank you. Sorry, Catherine, we're just under no. pressure. Time yeah, now. John, I appreciate. Yeah. As many as possible. Dennis, can you answer the question? Yeah, so both, both a, in terms of the upgrade and in terms of the ongoing use as it is. Yeah. So I suppose in terms of village status, uh, one of the things we, we have done there in the plan is we have a core, a core strategy which gives you a hierarchy of settlements within the county. Now, Dunmore doesn't appear in that hierarchy because it's just of its scale. It doesn't it doesn't have a scale to be classed as, as a village, you know, and um, so the census people stop at something like cluster of 50 houses in 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 a proximity together within a certain distance of one another so Dunmore doesn't doesn't unfortunately doesn't feature in 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 that scale of things so it, it it's not likely then that we would you know we would designate it as a village so um that's the first thing about the, the village data second then in relation to the the nr the nra you're quite right the the um the National Roads Authority or in situ, they've morphed into the TII as it is now Transport Infrastructure Ireland. So the same kind of rules apply for them. And you know, the, the concept of trying to develop uh, the park out there, you know, has that challenges around the accessibility. And, um, you know, so uh, the, the part aid process around that was going on. At, uh, I, I'm actually not sure where it is exactly in, the, in that process. So the proposal to do the development was put out there for public consultation and submissions were invited. And I know that's an issue that came up. And in fact, um, you know, the, the, the TII, TII themselves raised some issues around access from the N77. Into Dennis, the could I ask how, yep. um, how people living in um, locations like Catherine who have difficulty getting out on roads, you know, what can be done? You know, because I think everybody has heard stories of people taking 10 or 15 minutes to get across. Can Where did they go? Well, uh, well, essentially, in, in terms of the, the council, you know, there's not much that the council can do in terms of the national road. Is that it's it? a national road. So if you look at the Dunmore situation, there is a, there is a reduced speed limit for a limited period, just uh, just from from the church, say, out just out to uh, Beyond the last house there, most recently, that. so there is a, a 60 kph speed limit there. Okay. So if people aren't, you know, uh, 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 observing that speed limit, it becomes an enforcement issue. Then, so you know, this is how you how you you, you have to. I suppose that's that's the one bill. So it's complaint to the Gardaí or whatever. You know, they they're okay. the authority for enforcing that. So there's very little that can be done with with uh, if you have a direct access onto a national route. The okay. national routes are what they are, or you know, for moving traffic from one urban area to another. 
Okay, oh, question. I think this is for Nicholas. Are there plans for dedicated cycle and pedestrian ways? Peace Park and Canal did not appear to be included in presented analysis. Nicholas, can you quickly deal with that one? Hello, Nicholas. Yeah. Dr. John, yes. Yeah. Um, I didn't go into the detail about all the uh, individual objectives. Um, there are a few objectives in the, in the development plan. Uh, one, for instance, uh, is to develop a cycle route between the eastern environs and the Brega Valley. Uh, we, the, we are doing the cycling strategy in the, uh, the, the city uh, local transport plan. And hopefully that will include recommendations as to where the infrastructure and what kind of infrastructure is required. There's also uh, an objective to, uh, to, to uh, I suppose, investigate um, a cycle route, a linear cycle route along the, the River Nore. Um, but if you look at uh, section uh, 1251 uh, of the plan itself, there's, there's, there's a few objectives there. Um, so we're awaiting the outcome of the, the, the local transport plan to, to give us an indication as to, uh, you know, where these uh, cycle routes should be. And so just in relation to the objectives and just this process, it is open to people um, to to make submissions and it's possible that objectives may be amended, expanded, new ones um, added and so on. Is that feasible still at this part of the of the process? Nicholas? Yes, uh, people can make submissions. Um, oh, on the 12th of March. Those will be until the 12th of March, and those will be considered in the chief executive's report. And uh, if if there is merit in including them at this stage, uh, they will be included. Uh, but if we have to await uh, more detail from the local transport plan, they might not be included at this stage. Okay. There is um, an objective to imp implement the, the recommendations of the transport plan. While I have you, uh, Nicholas, as they said, to what extent is spatial planning working with transport to achieve climate targets in the plan, especially on the location of housing? I don't know, is that for you, Nicholas, or? Uh... Yes, I suppose that was that is the thrust of the presentation was to the, co the coordination of land use and transport, the uh, the promotion of the compact city, uh, the the achievement of a 10, 10 minute city for Kilkenny uh, to to have people live as close as possible to transport modes, uh, you know, uh, and and all the facilities. So compact growth is the driving force of this plan as well. So yes, there is a there's a there's a huge uh, coordination there between land use and transport. Okay. Um. There's a comment in from Aidan Collins who says, if any of the elected members or interested parties would like to visit a solar farm, please get in contact with me, Aidan.Collins at lightsourcebp.com uh, as light source of 10 solar farms in Northern Ireland. This includes the solar farm that powers Belfast International Airport in County Antrim. Thanks very much uh, for that, Aidan. Um, there was a question in from Ronan and uh, Oh, sorry, I dealt with that one already. Uh, this from Aidan Fitzpatrick. Do we have good data on the county's present emissions? Are these are there plans around addressing energy consumption and are we looking at increased energy consumption? Um, I don't know who that would address that. Would that be you, Katrina? I'll take that, John. Thanks. Um, yeah, so I just inserted two links to in the chat, one to the council's own climate change adaptation strategy, which would have some data. And of course, we will also be preparing a new climate action plan on foot of that new legislation um, in the coming, I don't know, year. I don't know the t exact time frame yet. And then also um, the three counties energy agency, they would also publish some data on emissions. And I've included um, the reference there. OK, thank you very much. Um, Jordan Butler uh, says it is currently proposed to restrict large scale wind farms uh, brackets five megawatts to those lands classified as acceptable in principle if adopted as is i'm curious how stringent implementation of this policy will be in practice will there be flexibility in considering large-scale wind farms on the basis of their own merits uh, e.g eia uh, appropriate assessment etc within open for consideration lands um i can barely understand the question so i don't really so, not refer it to so uh, yeah, well, i could take that one uh, yeah maybe. yeah john yeah so 
the intention of the plan, uh, you know, is to designate those areas. It's a very strategic approach to the allocation, spatial allocation of the wind farms and the type of wind farms and wind energy development. So in general, what I would say is uh, there wouldn't be a consideration, say, for a large um, scale wind energy development wind within the area, say, up for consideration, unless it fits into the categories as allocated in the plan. You know, so that that's the principle of that now it doesn't stop someone applying anyway if they want to so you know the process is they can apply locally and if they've refused locally they can take the appeal to the board or in the case of the the uh, project referred to by katrina uh, you know if it fits into a strategic infrastructure development category they could go directly to the board and take their chances but the fact that uh, you know the plan has that categorization it gives a very strong uh, you know bulwark against something like that happening so even the board are limited in what they can do in terms of contravening the plan okay and uh, naomi i think we might go to some more people who've got their hands raised i think um frank did you have your hand raised i can't see your surname there beside it so frank do you want frank to say sullivan there yeah, yeah. Frank Sullivan, I live in uh, Inishtig, and uh, first of all, I'd like to congratulate both uh, Katrina and Nicholas for very uh, informative presentations. My queries arise around, primarily around the transport area, which is, I didn't see a lot uh, dealing with the rural areas. Uh, I was very impressed with what was the uh, strategies that were being put in place for the city and its environs. So that was the uh, first part of the query. My second query is, have has there been any consideration given to, bearing in mind people like me living in industry, we rely on the car to move around primarily. Like, you know, we can walk so far, we can, you know, uh, cycle so far and swim so far, but we can't, uh, we need the car otherwise, like, you know. And has any consideration been given to providing park and ride facilities on the outskirts of Kilkenny so that people coming in from rural areas could park up and be driven in or uh, bust into the city centre and so forth and brought out again and, and they, to avoid bringing cars into the city centre. OK, thanks very yeah. much for that, Frank. Uh, Dennis, is that you coming in on that? Uh, yeah, I can come in on that. So I'll do, do the second part first there. So the park and ride for the city centre, yeah, that, that's something that has been looked at before. Um, and, uh, you know, the the thinking of it on it is, is that, again, Kilkenny, while it is a city of about 30, 26,000, 27,000 at the moment, the scale of the city just isn't big enough to to, to be able to achieve that. So, uh, so we have done the concept of park and stride as well. So, you know, if you look at the strategy at the moment, you come to the city, there's a number of large car parks around the outskirts of the city centre, be able to park there and then you walk or stride to, the, to where you want to go. Um, and But I think the park and ride, uh, park and ride will be examined again, uh, I, I think in the near future as part of the, uh, our own land use, our own uh, traffic, local transport plan that's been prepared as well. That's also part of that. So uh, in terms of the rural area transport then, yeah, you know, I think that's a, a very valid point. You, you know, people that live in rural areas have to have a car to access, uh, you know, services to a certain extent. But there also needs to be provision for, you know, uh, people that don't or don't want or can't drive in rural areas. So the idea of having, uh, you know, the ring and ink, a rural link connection um, for people living in rural areas is important. And, uh, you know, while that's not a spatial, a spatial allocation, uh, and it's not a function directly of the local authority. We do have reference to that in the transport section of the plan about supporting, uh, you know, those services for people living in rural areas. So, uh, you know, we, we have a limited function, I suppose, in deliverability, but in terms of policy, particularly around, uh, you know, elderly people living on their own uh, and that community and connectivity, particularly through, you know, which has been highlighted through the COVID experience, uh, you know, people need to be able to have connectivity and be able to get out to where they want to do their collect, get their services, whether it be, you know, the post office or visit the GP or wherever, visit friends. So, 
Okay. Yeah, so that, that'd be my, my comments on that. Thanks very much, Dennis. I don't know if you want to come back on that, Frank, is that? No. Okay, um, there's a number of comments in about the parking, uh, which has been raised at a number of meetings. There are more comments, so I'm not going to go through each of them, but people can read them and uh, judge for themselves. It's in the conversation. If you want to click the um, the the uh, speech bubble at the top, you'll see them all uh, and you can make your mind up uh, on those. I want to get through as many questions as possible. Great interaction and thank you very much. We'll come back to more people who have their hands uh, raised. But Paul Cotter says, and this is in relation to cycle lanes, he said, great plans for modal shift. And he asks, will there be a commitment around the development of segregated, protected, safe cycleways from the suburbs to the centre and schools to encourage others, kids, non-traditional cyclists and older people to cycle? The current cycle routes, he says, are mostly unbuffered, painted only and not end to end. And uh, I know what he means, having started cycling in and out to work recently. Junctions, car parked and crossings are a particular problem, Paul says. Yeah. Uh, so take that, I, Nicholas. Yeah, well, I, I can take that, John, maybe. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, is uh, so in terms of of uh, new developments, you'll see where uh, where the council are doing new works, certainly the segregated cycle routes are, are, are put in place. So, for instance, uh, going to the new road being built uh, along the Brega Valley, you'll see where the separated pedestrian and and uh, cycleways separated from the car completely. So in new situations that's done, it's much more difficult in retrofitting uh, that. So uh, to existing situations, particularly um, where you've got, you know, like say, Kenny City, where some of the, the streets are quite narrow in situations, but um, the best, where where the projects are being redesigned or retrofitted, you know, the best solution will be achieved. So, and that process is going on at the moment, as uh, Nicholas had said, we're, we're developing up uh, a pedestrian cycle link from the eastern uh, eastern side of the city over to the Brega Valley. So that work is ongoing and more and will, you know, will eventually make its way out to a part days uh, development proposal. And so that's the challenge, I suppose, where you got that is where do you, you know, sometimes there just isn't the physical space to put in, you know, your separated cycling, pedestrian, keep room for a bus, all these things. So it's, it's trying to fit uh, you know, a lot of activity into a, a limited space. But where the opportunity arises, they are segregated. Dennis, just to follow up on that from Caroline Schofield, uh, which is in uh, questioning about uh, crossing, it kind of relates to what Catherine was saying about uh, cyclists using the road having difficulty to cross. And she says, uh, well, she can cycle into the city in 13 minutes, but when she tries to cross at Greens Bridge and John's Bridge, I have to wait to be allowed to cross by traffic. And if she was in the Netherlands, she'd be given right away and she'd like to. So that's, I suppose, in relation to rules of the road, um, but also in relation to parking of bicycles. Um, uh, Caroline says she'd like to be able to park her bike in a dry area. And what are your thoughts on this? So any prospects i don't know if it's in the plan but what would the prospects be well, of a drier so, uh, i suppose the, the the one thing i'd say about the plan it is a high level plan like it's not a it's not a, a prescriptive of all the actions that is going to happen in a physical level or projects that are going to happen over the next six years some of those will evolve over time uh, you know so as the as the strategies evolve and people think about what we have to do to make the objectives happen so for instance the 10 minute city you know, one of the things that we have an objective there is to actually do a, an audit of the city to see what are the barriers to a development of 10 minute city. So things like that, you know, where you come across, well, how if I want to travel from A to B in the city, what are the obstacles and then how do you get over those obstacles? So a lot of those issues that are being identified tonight in relation to barriers for people for cycling and walking, they will be identified over time and, you know, projects to alleviate or change that uh, will happen in time. But you must remember that we're trying to, this is a transition and people don't, you know, people won't suddenly jump from 10% cycling to 20% cycling overnight. This is going to happen. Well, it needs to be helped along in that process, one, by putting in the right infrastructure and that in itself takes time. But I do think that over the next over the life of this government 
with with the Green Party in government and that you know the commitment in, in the programme of government is to have a lot of cycling infrastructure funded. So that was one of the things that came across in the programme of government, a shift in emphasis from road spending to to uh, more sustainable modes of transport. So I think you will see a lot of money being pumped into that area over the coming years. And okay. those projects, you know, we need to be ready with those projects, I suppose. And that kind of analysis is going on at the moment all the time through the, our own staff and through, again, through the local transport plan, which will deal with a lot of this type of issues. OK, uh, we're going to come to Richard Walsh uh, next, but just to remind you while while you're all of you while you're here that the issues brought up at these meetings as well as been ventilated this evening are also going to be considered in you know by the by the staff and and in the subsequent uh, uh progress of the uh consultation richard sorry for keeping you waiting for quite some time okay so i'm going to bring you back out to the lingon valley now um I'm living out here in Tullahawk. I'm looking across the valley to Henny's in County Tipperary. The Nigan Valley basically is a ring of hills stretching from Slevenamon, following the foothills of Slevenamon to the Kilkenny border, north and south. And then the foothills continue on into County Kilkenny, up to Mountain Gap and Lamoog, and the hills then sweep around over Black Bog, Brown Mountain down over, over Owning and come across on the bottom then via Barn Free Hill to meet up with the southern ring of hills from Tipperary. So it makes a circle of hills. Mm. Now, in the two present development plans, County Tipperary and County Kilkenny, that circle of hills are protected from development for wind turbines. In November of last year, Kilkenny County Council made a submission to the pre-draft consultation in Tipperary, asking that the Lingon Valley be protected from wind turbines. And then three weeks ago, I looked in at the development maps and all of the protected area in County Kilkenny is gone. So like you're talking about, reflecting what's happening in the neighbouring county and you're removing what's in our own county. Now in the middle of that, that Lingon Valley we have the Narcro Passage Tomb. The western chamber of that is aligned to the Tipperary Hills at where the, the sun sets in the evening. I personally have spent 16 years campaigning and fighting against trying to stop wind turbines being built where the sun sets in the Tipperary Hills. With the, with the support of Kilkenny County Council. And now the maps that we have here in front of us now are actually putting wind turbines close to where the sun rises on Kilkenny Hills. Okay, Dennis, would you like to... And, and, and not alone that, like you're saying, the green area is the preferred area. So the rest, the field next to Knock Road Passage Tomb is actually open to consideration. Okay. Like, yeah, so, I'm sorry if I'm going on, but- No, no, you're fine. Like, we, we know from <clears throat> applications in Tipperary, one development went on board in Ireland and was refused. So in all likelihood, if someone came in and wanted wind turbines here in this area, it would be refused. And why an area that has natural passage tomb, the megalithic tomb and Kilmacalibur, which is lined to the current and sleeping the man across the valley, it has the Western Ossery High Cross on each side of the border again. It's an area where you just wouldn't consider putting wind turbines and I am just amazed that this area is not zoned as unsuitable for turbines. Okay Richard, thank uh, Can someone address that then? Would that be Dennis or? Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll, uh, Concern in the Lingon yeah. Valley area, which I think we saw earlier on designated as an area of, of special tourism and there seems to be a feeling that the exclusion yeah. isn't 
total as it would so, seem. I suppose what I would say there is, uh, you know, uh, we in Katrina's presentation and the commentary afterwards, I think there was a question from um, Frank, uh, can't remember his second name there, Frank, around the Lingon Valley. So I did indicate there that, you know, this issue has been raised all right already with us. Uh, Richard is quite right. Uh, we did make a submission to the Tipperary plan. Just and I think just indicates the importance that we attach to this. We're not trying to, we're not trying to, um, uh, you know, two different things at different times. But I did make the reference that, th like, this is a challenge, uh, a significant challenge in the context of, uh, you know, two mandatory objectives that the council need need to be looking at. So one is around the mandatory objective to be implementing national policy in terms of renewable energies at a local level. So the emphasis was clearly put on the local authority to see how you would address that. And the second one then is again the protection of the heritage, protection of architectural heritage. Now we have done some work around that and that we did give a recognition to the Lingon Valley in itself in the statement. And we also uh, gave a recognition to the, uh, the architectural landscape, just referred around that, uh, what, you're, what you mentioned there, Frank, was the Knock Road Passage Tomb and its uh, orientations to the west and so on. So it's not a question of, of ignoring or it's not a question of trying to do the opposite of what we said in the in the Tipperary submission. It's a question of trying to find the right balance between the two. And you know, it's something that we will look at again as part of this because it has raised a lot of concerns locally. We're aware of that. We're not going to be, we're not going to dismiss them and we certainly will look at that again. So whether that's a greater, a greater, uh, you know, uh, greater or better objectives around the protection of the knock roll uh, area and the Lingon Valley, and maybe looking at extending that protection more. Uh, uh, that's one way. And then, you know, the open for the open for just refers to the open consideration. In any application, you, you must remember also there's also a suite of policies in the plan about the protection of the heritage. So just because it's open for consideration doesn't necessarily mean that protection isn't there, but certainly we'll review, we will be reviewing both the policies around Knock Row and the Lingon Valley and uh, the, the areas suitable for uh, wind farms in that area. Definitely, it's, it's just something that we will be looking at. Sorry, that, that seems uh, like a solid commitment to a review. Richard, uh, do you wish to respond to that? Hello? You're on mute, Richard. Yeah. OK, Richard, yeah. So, yeah, the point I've been making is these areas that say that, that are open for consideration, and, and even the priority archaeological area now, depending on Valley, like what that means is that if someone wanted to come in there with wind turbines, they'd have to do an impact assessment. They could still actually apply for the permission. Now, as I say, we we fought a number of, of applications and to, to protect the, the Western Chamber in County Tipperary in areas that were open for consideration. Now, we, we've succeeded so far in protecting the passage to them. That has cost the local community, ordinary members of the public, around about 50,000 euros. Now, now we're faced with looking at the same problem in County Kilkenny. And, and uh, another point on that, just in this big block of it, that's, acceptable. There's a strip running from Lamouk through Wine Gap Village and on to Nine Mile House. Now, on the map, it looks to be maybe less than a kilometre wide. That, that line of green takes in the creamery in Wine Gap, the public house, the shop, the children's playground, the school, an artistic unit, the new community hall, the hurling pitch, the church grotto, and the loop walk back to back towards Calamry. Okay. Like, 
there's no way that you could put a wind turbine up there. Okay, well, I think, so, Richard, on the, I mean, I'm hugely familiar with the issue, but my understanding is that Dennis gave a clear commitment that Kilkenny County Council will review the policies in relation to the that area. Is that a fact, Dennis? Yeah, so uh, again, going back to the question, that was a similar question to what Frank um, Frank had raised earlier. So I did give a commitment that we would look at that, uh, you know, and I think the point is well made about Knock Row and the passage tombs and all that. And we are aware of that. It's a matter of trying to, you know, get to the get to the 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 nub of what the characteristics are and what what area can we extend that to. So I say we did get an analysis done of the architectural uh, sorry, the archaeological heritage, and that was something that we we did prior to the, to as part of the preparation of the plan to, with our own heritage officer. So it's we didn't ignore the situation, but it, it's a question of then trying to take on board the comments that people like yourself are making, Frank, and looking at this again in, in a slightly different angle, or maybe seeing how we can get greater protection, as you're you're talking about through the knock row, and just to make the point about the open for consideration, they're very limited very limited, uh, uh, you know, developments allowed in the open for consideration. So it's single use auto producer and community uses with five or less turbines. So in that context, it, you know, the area is, is it could be big enough to accommodate something like that, as long as the characteristics associated with the Lingon Valley and the Knock Row are protected. So I, I, I think we'll we'll have to move on, but I think it's fair to say that, That's fine. Yeah, thanks, John. that, thanks, that um, you know that, that that anybody who's been in the area um really appreciates what a fantastically beautiful area it is and it, it's you know there are plans to develop the tourism, but what you're saying is yeah. that you're very mindful of all those uh concerns yeah, and exactly that you will this. yeah, okay. Uh, take those on board in moving forward. OK, um, I'm going to take another uh, question. I'm mindful of time moving on now. It's almost nine o'clock. But Maura says, in light of the significant area that is open in principle for wind energy development back onto the Carlock and Kenny border around Castle Warren, Clara, Ballyfoyle, Larkins Bridge, Muckalee and surrounding areas and the number of projects planned in the area, can the council reconsider the characteristics of the valley landscape and large number of dwellings in the area with a view to the visual impact. Dennis, is that you again? Um, yeah. Um, so I suppose we had, uh, the, way it, <coughs> excuse me, the way I would answer that is uh, I'm just looking at the map here in front of me. I have it, uh, and I'm, I think I can identify where she's talking about. It's up in the northeast corner of the of the county, I'd say from Muckley up towards uh, the border with County Carlow. So it, it is open for, for in principle, but um, just in relation to the <clears throat> the characteristics, we have our landscape character assessment, and I suppose the sieve mapping that was outlined by Katrina did throw up this area as a potential site. And uh, the safeguards around that, you know, for people living in the area is, is in relation to the setback distance for noise the, and visual impact and so on and flicker. So it, at the moment, uh, that's the way it's set up, and you know we, we can. What I do is I would encourage. Um, is it Mora was the lady's name? Yeah, I encourage Mora like to make a submission on that on that basis. So um, I suppose I can't give a, a, a you know I can't give a detailed answer to, to her concern. Only to say that uh, if she makes a submission, we will look at it again in that context of the of the where she's talking about the uh, the amount of population in the area, but. There are other safeguards set into that in terms of, of the, the the policy and the plan and the guidelines that you know over, override just the, the thing set in principle it's just so in principle it means we can consider them, but the, there are other constraints around that that need to be taken into account okay dennis thanks a million a uh, quick question will there be a protected cycleway going to the new cbs secondary school on dunningstown road it's important not just for the environment but also to tackle Tackle child obesity, and that comes from Ronan Daly. Quick answer to that: Is that you? Quick Nick? answer: uh, or, Yes, yeah, cycling and walking will be a, a significant element of how people access the school. Not okay. only we do recognise that you know, for instance, teachers will want to drive to the school. That's fair enough, but we're trying to encourage connectivity to the school from the city through walking and cycling. Yeah, now um, we were talking earlier on about the biodiversity park in Dunmore and just a reminder coming in from Councillor Maria Dollard that the closing date for public uh, submissions on the consultation 
is tomorrow at 5 p.m. So if anyone wants to put in that, just bear that in mind. Uh, question in for Maura, what is the policy in relation to wind energy development near the aerodrome in Holden's Rath and statutory health and safety implications? It would appear that the lands in this area are open in principle in the proposed draft plan. Uh, yeah, so I think it's uh, it would be open for consideration, but it's like anything, um, you know, there are you don't just put a development. You have to have regard to what's around you. So I suppose in any situation, like the first thing I would say is that, you know, an application for a wind farm would automatically get referred to the IBA, Irish Aviation Authority in terms of you know what their requirements would be, uh, and then that would be taken on board in relation to the to the application. It would be okay. processed. But just to say again, if you open for consideration. It's small scale, so single turbines, auto producers, and community developments of five or less. So okay. uh, you know, I, I, uh, I take the point, but there are safeguards in there. Okay, I'm going to try and quickly deal with people who've had their hands raised. I'm not sure, Eddie Hulahan, did you have your hand raised? Did you wish to say something? Uh, yeah, um, go, Eddie. Yes, John, thanks very much. Uh, just to echo what uh, Catherine Peters and uh, Mairead said before us, vis-a-vis -vis the situation in Dunmore, and I realise that things can't be done at a drop of a hat, and we have to get into the queue. My uh, my suggestion or my ask of, of, of the plan would be that it would be at least be put into the queue uh, for future developments. Uh, I, I appreciate that the National Roads Authority or the TII uh, have, have a big say in it, but like people are around here can recall visiting the hall in Dunmore where they put up three options on three different routes from Kilkenny to Ballyragget. And, you know, that's back in the day. Um, the roads haven't changed. And if you consider if you're in Galway and you're going to the boat in Ross Lair, which a lot of transport does, it comes down this road uh and everyone in between so it is a rather busy road and if you look at all the fantastic developments that the council have done the Cal the callan road the footpath out as far as the rugby club uh, the Dum dublin road the freshford road they all have got some form of um pedestrianization or cycleway or something like that which is absolutely fantastic uh all we're saying is please give us our turn now okay OK, thanks, Eddie. I don't know if that. Do you want to say anything? Any yeah, so just comment, uh, just make a comment on that. Yeah, so a, a point well made, Eddie, uh, I take care and, and thanks for the, the compliments on the developments carried out. But just to say the end 77. So if you look at what's happened over the years again, so the piece from the from the County Loud, County Leash border up to Ballinus Lee, that was done a few years mm. ago. The next phase is in progress from um, from the end of that scheme into Bally Ragged. So I'd say things will be done in stages. So I think what I would say is we would certainly look at uh, inserting an objective in there for the, the bit from Kilkenny out to out to Bally Ragged, if you like, which would be another significant section. But again, as you, as you know, these things are in, at the end of the day, Finance is critical for these things to happen, and it often sits in the national picture of where the N77 would point well made about the traffic coming from the north and west uh, of Kilkenny and coming making their way down towards uh, Rosslea or south of Ireland, Waterford, for instance. They'll come in from from uh, Galway and all that kind of catchment area in through uh, Bally Ragged and down in the N77 and uh, around the city and so on. So, point is well made there, and. Uh, Certainly, uh, you know, that's something that we'll take out of tonight's meeting anyway. OK, thank you. Uh, Maura asks me, Chairman, are you going through the chat questions in order? Maura, I'm doing my best. There's a, a large stream of observations, questions. Um, Katrina is supplying information to people as well, so I'm trying to do it in order, but there's new ones coming in. If I've missed your question, apologies. Uh, you're there. You're welcome to ask it if you like. Is Maura there? Mara, no, I can't see Mara. Mara, no. Okay, I'll move on. Is there anyone else with their hands raised to ask a question? I actually see a physical hand raised there now. It's Paddy. Paddy, if I could ask you to keep your input short enough, because we're pa we're just past nine o'clock now, and I think people probably want to be making a floor of yours. Yeah, I'll keep it short. So. 
Um, you have a cycle and strategy, right? And bearing in mind, um, tourism is, has been and will be affected for the next few years. So we should be considering cycle loops. Now, view Thomastown as the center point of what I'm saying. Within a five mile radius of Thomastown, you can take Innistee, Woodstock, Balladuff, Ballahale, Stonyford, Innisnag, uh, Bennisbridge, Gorm, uh, Craig, Namana. Now, there's a network of secondary roads in here that are that are safe. I cycle these regularly myself. And the potential here to address our fitness levels plus uh, staycations should be looked at. Um, and I, I will make a submission to that yeah. to decide the strategy. Yeah. Thanks, Paddy. I'll leave it yeah, at that. That's a, yeah. that's a good idea, Paddy. Yeah, no, that'll be a welcome a submission on that, that vein, yeah. I right, hope. Okay. Um, so a lot of these are comments. Mary Rice says where routes are made one way, the other side would be allocated to so walking, cycling. Would be great to see more one-way routes in the city. Um, lots of positive thoughts in. Um, hopefully, <laughs> I haven't missed any questions. Um, I had to run out and get a charger for my phone at one stage, so maybe I missed something there. Uh, thanks coming in. Anyone, um, Naomi, you've been keeping an eye on the um on the people putting their hands up. Is there anyone we've missed? I think we uh, did we deal with Donald Deering? I think we've dealt with Donald. Have yeah, we, or had you Donald. Dealt with? Yes, uh, maybe as another comment or? <laughs> yeah, unless there's something else. Otherwise, everyone that has their hand raised is. No, no, no comment. Sorry, you dealt with me. Sorry. OK, okay thanks, that's great. Thanks, Donald. Thanks, Donald. Yeah. That's Donald okay. resolved. So it's just I comments, think, John. Yeah, I think I, we've covered most questions. If anybody uh, feels that we haven't got to one of their deal deal with Paddy Phelan's question on. OK, sorry, I'll try and find that. Uh, excuse me now, talk among yourselves and uh, I, I try to find the question. Sorry, you know, yeah, I can I can just come in there, John. It's just yeah. Is that you, Paddy? Is it? Yeah. Yeah. You'd like to do oh. it yourself. Sorry. Yeah, this thing is highlighted in National Climate Action Plan as a key route to decarbonise heat. Are there opportunities to incorporate this as an objective for urban settlements in the plan? Yeah, I suppose it's a more recent objective of the uh, programme for government. And there are some plans coming in the revised Climate Action Plan. So it is relatively new, but it is uh, a consideration that, that m might not have been looked at in in areas outside of Dublin in the past, but it looks like it's going to be considered as a, for urban centres where there's a population um, demand and and waste heat opportunities around business and the likes mm. of Ballyragget where they would have waste heat in, in for example, Lambia, there could be district heating brought into the village and so on and so forth. Katrina, is that a question yeah. for you? You'll uh, put me on the spot here now. It's probably not fair me asking that question now, Katrina, to be fair. Um, Hi, Paddy. No, I'm, I had to. I have to refresh my my memory on this section. Um, no, we do have policies in relation to district heating in the plan. So um, they're set out under the bioenergy section. So 11.6, Chapter 11. Now I can't. I wouldn't have time to go through it here, but I'm just looking to see. Um, no, I, I couldn't recall know. exactly, but it's just a very yeah. recent, a recent just, objective of government. So just to make sure it's covered. That's all. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I know we did look at um, possibly designating maybe the Abbey Quarter as, yeah. I don't know, Dennis, did you want to come in yeah, on Yeah, so just to comment on that, look, I know it's a, it's a fair enough question, uh, Paddy, but I suppose it's, it's, uh, it's, it is something in terms of the Kilkenny experience, uh, you know, uh, it's not something that I'd say there's been a lot of progress on, but it certainly was looked at in the context of the Abbey Quarter or renewal uh, uh, there. And... Uh, you know, I think there was, uh, there was site visit to Tralee, Kerry, Tralee, where they have a scheme already. Uh, I'm afraid the finance just wasn't stacking up on it. So I think there needs to be, while it is easy to say, look at it, I think there needs to be a work done on that around uh, the cost of the schemes and who benefits and who, how much it charges and how. So similar to like the the micro generation, I heard you on the radio this morning discussing that. So the price point of these things is important and to make them financially viable 
I think it's important and it's a great idea. You know, if you could do a district heating system, it'd be fantastic to be able to get that energy and reuse it for people's homes rather than everyone doing their own thing. But I think there's significant challenges around it. But as Katrina said, we have a statement in the plan covering it. And maybe, you know, when we see the new uh, the new bill coming through, we might be able to bolster that a bit more in, the, in that context. OK, thank you, Dennis. Um, we've had uh, we've had very good engagement tonight. People are starting uh, to drift away now. We had up to uh, almost 80 people on the call at one stage. I'd just like to thank everybody for your contributions. Dennis will wind up now, but just to remind you that there is another session on next Monday evening in the, uh, and it's on the theme of natural and built heritage. So I would encourage you all to uh, register. It's very good to have such engagement and some such questioning and such obvious interest and passion uh, for the issues. And I think we had the biggest engagement of any of the sessions uh, this evening so far. A lot of important issues, uh, wind farms, uh, alternative energy, cycling is a, is a big one. Um, and all of them very important issues and of course many issues that we didn't have an opportunity to discuss but just a reminder that you can still make submissions up until that date which is I think if I'm not mistaken the 13th uh, of March so do get sorry, sorry. 12th of March 12th, mistake number two just to make sure yeah okay um Dennis would you like to uh, wind it up yeah so uh, thanks for putting up the screen there um so just to say, first of all, thanks to everyone for tuning in tonight, all the people that took their time to the two hours of their, their precious time to both to listen to us talking and, and uh, answering. We did our best we can, I suppose, in terms of answering the questions. So just for everyone that tuned in, thanks very much. I'd like to thank uh, uh, Katrina, Naomi and Nicholas for the presentations. Uh, excellent as ever. And uh, just thanks to you, John, as well, just for again having a the difficult job of chair. And, and as you said, tonight's attendance was 78 people, uh, which took a little bit of managing uh, in terms of content. And also just a thanks to N Naomi there in the background as well, doing a uh, producer of your program. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, and say on the screen, just to say again, just to remind people again that next Monday night is on Built Heritage. And, and uh, natural heritage, and uh, I suppose a little bit about uh, place making as well, which is important. And I encourage you to, to there's still time to log on and then to make submissions, go on to consult.kilkenny.ie, email by our plan at .ie, or by post uh, at, the, at the address given there at the planning department. So, with that, John, yeah, I'd just like to, again just to thank everyone for coming, and uh, we'll see you, see you hopefully on Monday. See you all next Monday. Thank Thanks you. to everybody. Yeah. And um, I was just about to say safe home, but uh, presumably everybody's pretty much at home these days. And uh, we're all looking forward to getting back to drafty halls on a wet winter evenings when we can actually walk and stand out in the car park around puddles and all that sort of stuff that we used to be complaining about. But look, we'll get there. So everybody stay safe. Uh, and don't let the old COVID stuff get you down. Very refreshing. Yeah. It was hardly discussed all evening, so um, uh, which makes a welcome break. Uh, so thanks everybody again. Thanks to everybody in yeah. Kenny County Council, and we'll see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Thanks, John. Take care. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Yeah. Yeah,